Welcome back to Plan A. In this episode, we're going to talk about St. Ignatius of Loyola's rules for discernment of spirits, and we're going to talk about the rules three and four. In the past episode, we talked about rules one and two, so if you haven't watched that one, you might want to consider watching that before we get into this one. And uh, I'm partic particularly excited about this episode because these rules have been a huge help in my life uh, in navigating certain things that naturally come when you start praying. And Father Eric has been a big help in uh, guiding our group to, to know those rules. So welp welcome again, Father Eric. Well, thank you, Taylor. Happy yes. to be here. Yes. Happy to be here. Should we just dive into the rules then? I think so, yeah. Okay. Well, well, you know, as with rules one and two, the wording is, is kind of archaic, but we'll just kind of read through what they are, and then uh, after that, we'll just kind of break them open a little bit. So the third rule, the third is of spiritual consolation. I call it consolation when some interior movement is caused in the soul, so some sort of thought, emotion, um, feeling, desire, you know, interior movement cause in the soul, through which the soul comes to be inflamed with love of its Creator and Lord, and consequently when it can love no created thing on the face of the earth in itself, but only in the Creator of them all. So almost an increase in, in love of God when we have that feeling of an increase, an increased release of love of God. Ignatius goes on, likewise when it sheds tears that move to love of its Lord, whether out of sorrow for one's sin or for the passion of our Lord, or because of other things directly ordered to his service and praise. Finally, I call, it cons I call consolation every increase of hope, faith, and charity, and all interior joy that calls and attracts to heavenly things and to the salvation of one's soul quieting it and giving it peace in its creator and Lord. So there's a lot there, but basically what spiritual consolation is, you could almost think of it as sort of that, that kind of warm spiritual fuzzy that we get sometimes where we just have a, a great love of the Lord or a, just a deeper trust in the Lord or a greater desire to serve Him or just a greater love for something holy. Just, just all those things are spiritual consolation. You know, we don't know why they come, but suddenly they're there. Now, the fourth rule is spiritual desolation, and this is the opposite of consolation. So what Ignatius says for rule four, I call desolation all the contrary of the third rule, such as darkness of the soul, disturbance in it, movement to low and earthly things, disquiet from various agitations and temptations, moving to lack of confidence without hope, without love, finding oneself totally slothful, tepid, sad, and if separated from one's Creator and Lord. And just as, con just as consolation is contrary to desolation, in the same way the thoughts that come from consolation are contrary to the thoughts that come from desolation. So in other words, if consolation is sort of those warm sort of thoughts, desires, emotions that come up spiritually, maybe in prayer, maybe somewhere else, desolation is the opposite. It's when we get that darkness, when we just suddenly just suddenly have a spiritual worry. We just have a lack of confidence. You know, maybe a, a fear that God is not with us, a, a, a fear that He's not guiding our lives anymore, that we're messing everything up. Instead of focusing on God, we're, we're turning inward. It's the complete opposite of spiritual consolation. I don't know if that, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I. I think why these two rules, I think, were particularly, um, they really helped me understand things is because I think once you engage prayer or you engage the spiritual life, you, you do experience great highs, you know, way, way, way up here. You experience God and, and um, in various ways during prayer or I know for me oftentimes, um, 
it will be like right after communion even uh, in mass sitting there and you just have this 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 feeling of God's presence, this feeling of his love, those times aren't hard to navigate, right? You're just like, mm-hmm. yeah, I just want to be here. I, I feel like that, that's, mm-hmm. a, that's a foretaste of heaven, right? I just want to be here forever. <laughs> I hope this never goes away. But then the fourth rule is what follows is that like, well, in this life, it's not the norm that it sticks around forever. Although that be our desire, and I think what's, what's particularly interesting about that is, is <clears throat> then the question is for us, okay, well, what do we do in that time of desolation? Mm-hmm. What do we, what's the proper response when it seems like all of that great feeling just is, goes away? Is God not there with us anymore? Or what's, what's he doing in our souls at that point? No, I think that's great because like, like you say, you know, when we get those moments of spiritual consolation, they're fairly easy to navigate. Like we, we're just, God has given us a grace and all he wants to do is for us to enjoy it. Really the only big spiritual trap that we fall into in consolation, I think, is just assuming it's going to last forever. Mm-hmm. You know, we get that sort of, you know, James Cameron, I'm the king of the world <laughs> moment, yeah. you know, or we think, you know, <laughs> I've figured everything out spiritually. You know, I mean, I mean, that can put us, set us up for danger, but... Mm-hmm. Really, there isn't a lot of danger in spiritual consolation. We have that real warm feeling of God. But when we have those feelings of desolation, boy, things get much more confusing. And sometimes it's, it's the worst, like after a moment of consolation, mm-hmm. right? Like we, we thought everything was good, and then all of a sudden we're just so disoriented when we just have this, this sense of, like what's going on right now? Like I don't feel like I felt before, and so I think um, the real blessing for me of of Ignatius's rules is just how do we navigate that desolation? Because it, it comes up often enough, mm-hmm. and it and it really is kind of discombobulating. You know, it's normal, mm-hmm. but we just we just forget that it's normal <laughs> and. Um, yeah, for me, I think that's that's the biggest help is that, you know, what do I do when that comes up? Like, how do I how do I handle that? Because there, there's a real we're just really vulnerable when spiritual desolation happens. Like, it's just because we're questioning things and we're wondering if all our spiritual exercises, if they were worth it. Mm-hmm. Like, if this following of God meant anything, or if I was just making it all up. Right. You know, um, we're just, the devil can be very active in the midst of desolation. It's a time where he, he sees his opportunity and he just jumps in. So, um, yeah, I think even that, that fifth rule, you know, of just not making significant spiritual changes in our practices mm-hmm. during desolation, that, that's a huge rule in just keeping us steady, you know, because... When the desolation sets in, it's like, okay, everything I've tried is not working. Right. Because why am I feeling this? You know? Right. So, I must have taken a, a, a wrong turn somewhere. Yeah, you, yeah. Those sort of thoughts start to come up. Yeah. I definitely experience those. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and so the temptation is to say, okay, well, my spiritual reading in the morning or my adoration before work, well, obviously that didn't work because I'm feeling this. Right. And so I got to try something different because this isn't working. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you take a step back, you see how clearly the devil is working off our vulnerability, right? That spiritual reading in the morning, that adoration in the morning, or or whatever the spiritual practice is, it's clearly from God. It clearly has strengthened us and brought us benefits. But the devil sees, okay, I've got this, I've got this opening right now. Mm And I can get him to move away from that. You know, this thing that really has helped him. Mm-hmm. That he put a lot of thought and discernment into doing. You know, I can get him to turn away from it. And so, yeah, it is, navigating desolation, as you say, it, it is such a challenge. And, and I think that's the great, the great blessing of Ignatius' rules, is just sh- giving us some sense of how to do that. 
Well, and I know, Father, you kind of talked on it before, just how having those, fe- you know, those those feelings and those thoughts and you know of the desolation. And I think that's that's been a big thing for me is, you know, those understanding that th- those feelings are real. I mean, that's that's real. Um, you know, whether it's physical, whether it's kind of like stress, mental, you know, say desolation or something that's going on, but that doesn't that doesn't need to dictate what we do spiritually, right? I mean, you know, I think sometimes, you know, and I could, I mean, a little bit of witness, like even right now, you know, drinking coffee, pretty, uh, pretty uh, under, uh, you know, not getting very much sleep lately, you know, some stress like work-wise, so, but what does that do in my life? You know, and I think in the past, I've kind of fallen into that kind of spiral of, okay, oh, I'm too tired to get up to pray. Oh, I'm, I got all these other thoughts going on, all these other distractions. And that takes me away from prayer. And I think that's one thing that really stuck out to me going through rule four was really you start to see what spiritual desolation looks like. And kind of that check is what's the impact in your prayer life? Is it taking you away from prayer? Is your prayer a lot more distracted? Um, or, you know, just a lot more distractions in prayer. So I don't know if that is just kind of some of that practical for kind of what I've seen in my own life. Um, that's really kind of helped to kind of navigate that a little bit to understand that no, keep going on that path. Like, you know you need to continue in that relationship and ultimately trust that God's, obviously, he's still there. He's still working and it's for a reason. One of the things I, I think is, is key with that is that as you go through the rules, you know, for a soul that's trying to, to follow God and, you know, and you wouldn't be watching, nobody would be watching this, this mm. video if they weren't trying to go, right. grow in God. But the evil one's voice takes on a very discouraging tone. Mm-hmm. And like you say, you know, it, it's almost, with your example, it's like he wants me to, to stop going on the path that I'm on. Right. I've made certain commitments. I've made certain choices that are coloring how my day goes. And, yeah, the devil just wants me to move away from that. And so there, there's always that discouraging quality mm-hmm. about his voice for someone who's trying to follow God. I love what you say about lack of sleep too, because you know, you know these these rules three and four they don't apply to everything, right? I mean, you're not. It's not right. as though we're always in spiritual consolation mm-hmm. or desolation, right? That they don't describe the totality of the spiritual life. So when you say lack of sleep, you know that's what Ignatius would term a natural desolation, right? right? It, it, it's not spiritual per se, right? It's it's uh, it's not caused by any spiritual movement it's just you feel bad because you didn't sleep it's it's natural uh, but there's such a connection mm-hmm. you know it's a slippery slope isn't it, it? <laughs> is natural desolation can lead quickly to spiritual desolation it just opens us up because we are tired we're in a vulnerable place and so it's so we have to watch natural desolation just like we would watch spiritual desolation mm-hmm. you know so it, just that connection is fascinating because I, I know in my own life Sometimes it can feel like natural desolation. I have to watch as much as spiritual desolation because, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. like you, I'm you know I'm pushing myself. I'm you know not paying attention to when my body says stop, rest, um, you know, and then the, then that can easily lead to spiritual desolation. All right. All right. So, Father, you mentioned that um, it, it sounds like in desolation, maybe the devil gets a little bit more room to play on us. If God loves us, why? Why does He get? Why does He get that room? That doesn't. I mean, I I know for a, that question oftentimes pops up in in desolation. Mm-hmm. I think for a soul going through it, like, Lord, I thought you loved me. Why are you letting the enemy of my soul come after me at this point? What what's God trying to bring about there? I guess. You know, and Ignatius talks about in that. I think it's the ninth rule. Um, just reasons for desolation. And some of it is we bring it on ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, like we were talking mm-hmm. about how Brian and I, you know, we don't rest like we should. And so, right. you know, then we start giving up spiritual practices. And then, you know, we're kind of there because of choices we made. But um, but he talks about a couple other reasons, too. And, and one is basically to stretch us, right? To see, God wants to see how far we'll go in love of him. Mm-hmm. You know, the only way he can stretch us is by allowing us to go through desolation. The only way we can really choose him when it's hard is if desolation 
happens. So part of it is to increase our capacity to choose him. Mm -hmm. You know, he has to let us choose him in difficult moments if, if we're going to grow in that ability, if we're going to grow in our love for him, our ability to, uh, to, to choose him. And, and the other reason Ignatius gives is really just <clears throat> kind of increasing our gratitude, our humility. You know, gratitude and humility are, are virtually the same thing, right? I mean, humility is the virtue by which we attribute all the good we have right. to God, right? right? Um, and so, you know, desolation reminds us of just kind of how pathetic we are spiritually, right? right? right. You know, how, how we're just, uh, we can get discombobulated spiritually so easily. And so it really does increase our gratitude that when consolation comes, we can say, thank you, God. This is all you. And when we're, being when we're being given gifts, when we're being given consolation, and we can see it all as gift, we're just so much more healthy spiritually. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I, I feel like one of the things that te tends to happen the longer that, um, like in, in my life when I've experienced consolation, is oftentimes there will be this sneaky pride that enters in, mm -hmm. right? There will be this like, oh, you're doing really good. Or, you know, and maybe that's, maybe that's the devil playing on my mind. Maybe it's, it's things rising up in me. I'm not exactly sure, and I think it probably varies from time to time. But <clears throat> nevertheless, I think that to the extent pride enters in, we, we do have to, we have to be knocked down or wrong. It's like, hey, you're not God. Everything you're doing in this time of consolation is only because you're experiencing my grace and you're feeling it. Well, yeah. And that makes a lot of sense because, I mean, pride is a barrier to prayer. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, if, you're, if, if, that, if that lifeline is being cut off, then, you know, obviously you're, you're going to slip into kind of a time of desolation. So, yeah, yeah. And I think, sense. I mean, our society breeds this in us, too. You know, you think of, and, and it's a good thing, right, all the, all the self-help movements and stuff. But the focus is on me on that, right? What do I got to do? Mm -hmm. Right. And that just, uh, you know, the whole spiritual life is about, in a healthy sense, forgetting ourselves and focusing on God. You know, and there's just such a natural tendency yeah, with spiritual growth to just kind of grade ourselves. Mm -hmm. And just the very act of grading ourselves pulls our focus off of God and back on ourselves. And it just, it really does. It breeds that whole tendency of, well, yeah, the reason I'm, things are going well right now is because mm -hmm. I did A, B, C, D, you know. Mm -hmm. And we do have to experience desolation to be reminded, no, this was all a gift from God. Right. It was all a gift from God. What you felt after Holy Communion... You know, you didn't manufacture that. That was me and your soul letting you experience my love for you. You didn't cause that to happen. And anything that moves you to think that, I have to, I have to squash. Right. So that you can really enjoy that moment. Right. So that you can truly be love purified. That's what it sounds like. So can you talk a little bit, um, I think what really helped me too is understanding in times of desolation, what the devil actually has, how he can affect us. Like, what, what does he have permission to do in us? Uh -huh. You know, wh where are his boundaries? Or, or what can he, can he put thoughts into our head? How, how does that work? Yeah. So, I, I, you know, like we talked about in, in um, last week's video, um, you know, the devil has no power unless we give it to him. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, he can't do anything unless we consent. But I, I think at least for me, the dynamic in desolation would be something like this. Um, you know, yesterday I was in consolation, right? So I, I felt this real closeness to God and I was there. And so today I'm feeling desolation, right? Like I just feel like, you know, the problems of the day are overwhelming me. Where is God in the midst of this? God, I can't do this. Uh, you know, I, I move towards this, this sense of desolation. So these thoughts are arising from who knows where, right? They could be arising from just psychological wounds that I have. They could be, they could be the evil one planning them. But, right. but whatever the case, I'm in desolation, right? Right. And, and for me, like, a lot of what the devil does is when I have those really 
those thoughts of negativity, of not trusting in God, of doubting God's presence with me, of not having faith, hope, and love, all the devil has to do is just say, yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. You know, what you're thinking and feeling, that's true. What you thought and felt yesterday in consolation, not true. Today is reminding you that yesterday was an illusion. Mm -hmm. Today is what's real. So I know in my life, that's all the devil has to do is just take what thoughts and feelings are just sort of arising in desolation and just say, yeah, yeah, that's what's true. He doesn't have to do much. And I think it's yeah. interesting because I, I, I feel like the more we come to know ourselves and how we typically act, the more we can tend to see, like I know for myself, um, I have more of a melancholic temperament. So it, it oftentimes does, the, the devil will come in, in discouraging things right when I wake up. You know, like he, he's there trying to pick right away or, you know, or maybe it's even just the normal course of my mind. But like you said, like, yeah, 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 go with that one. Right. And it's been a real blessing for me to to just realize that, hey, there's that third player that actually wants you to go down that negative path and wants you to keep having those thoughts where you bury yourself and you forget that you even are a child of God, you know, where it's like, well, if I just wake up and I and I'm. And I, and I have my whereabouts, right? And I can say, well, I know there's that third player. I know God's calling me to be his child. Um, when I'm feeling these, these thoughts that would normally bring me to desolation, to actually just like cast them out right away, to just I'll ignore it, have the freedom to go push back on it and be like, I don't have to have that. That, that doesn't have to define me. That has given me a ton of freedom and I think recognizing consolation and desolation that that's a normal course of things has just been a huge help. Uh, yeah. And, and the big thing is like, God doesn't want me to go with that thought. Right. So I'm going to push against it. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want me to, to go that direction. So yeah, I think that's, I, I love what you say about self-knowledge because I think that is, that is huge. I mean, the devil's, the devil has a playbook for each of us mm -hmm. and it is based on who we are. So the more we understand who we are, our tendencies, the more we can get a sense of his playbook. I, I just love the example of knowing that, okay, I'm more vulnerable in the morning. You know, I mean, I, I too have kind of that melancholic personality. In the morning, I am so much more susceptible. I got to get moving in the morning. I got, that's when those negative thoughts, you know, a lot of times they're thoughts of like, just imagining all that's got to come in the day. Right. And it just seems like this overwhelming mm -hmm. mountain. Mm -hmm. And God doesn't want me to stay there, right? He wants me to just, it might be just something as simple as, okay, I think these are the three big tasks that I'm going to really need help with. I trust that you're going to help me with them. I give them over to you, right? There's a way of pushing back against that, just that feeling of overwhelmingness, you know, of just right. like, I can't do it, you know. And yeah, so, you know, to know that, like, so for you and I, we know that, okay, morning devil's going to be particularly vulnerable well for someone else it might be a different time of day right, right. and and similarly it's it's different types of temptations depending on our our different personalities so i think that that's just a great thing i think the more we grow in our self-awareness of when we're vulnerable how we're vulnerable what his tactics are going to be just the stronger we get because like you say it gives us that freedom it gives yeah. us that freedom to push back to say, okay, you know, I, I've gone down that path of thoughts before, mm -hmm. and that is clearly not where God wants me to go, so I'm going to push back. Well, and I like that too because, um, you know, kind of to tie back to some of the previous episodes, you know, the discussion on prayer, I mean, really that time of, of silence. You know, we live in a time right now, a society where, I mean, there's, there's constant noise, you know, there's constant availability of, you know, through electronics, whatever the case might be of, um, you know, just silence as, as in such shortage, it seems like. So having that prayer, taking that time daily, um, you know, even just turning the radio off as you're driving somewhere and just thinking, you know, even if it's not necessarily prayer, but just allowing, allowing God that space, um, just to work within yourself, you know, to, to, to speak to you and to understand and to realize these things. Um, I know that was a, that was a huge thing for me. Just, just to kind of understand a little bit more who I am, where, 
where I'm fall, falling short, and then in turn, okay, once you start recognizing that, how much more you need him. No, I think that that's huge because I, I, you know, maybe the devil's biggest success in our society might be just keeping things so mm -hmm. noisy, so yeah. active. Um, you know, and, and I think it, it's a challenge for us. Sometimes we have to make sacrifices to create that silence. Right. You know. Um, they, well, they seem like sacrifices at the time. They do, and then yeah. once, And then once you do it, yeah. you're like, oh, wow, I, that, was, that was obviously what was How did I live without yeah. that? Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. I, I do think it's like you say, too. I mean, the devil's, you know, with keeping everything noisy and active, um, you know, it, the, what the devil's trying to do is to try to get us not to think and even pour, more importantly, not to listen. If he gets us to a place where we're good-willed, but we're not listening particularly to him, right, who speaks in silence, and we're not thinking, well then, whatever comes up in society, we're, we're just going to be like leaves in the wind, mm -hmm. you know. There's, At, there's yeah. a, oh, sorry. No. Um, I know in your, uh, in kind of your bulletin article that you wrote, kind of previewing Plan A, you referenced Dr. Brant Petrie's spiritual classes, and one of the things that really stood out with that um, was, I mean, there's a lot of great material in there, highly recommend it. But one of the things he said is if you're not growing, you're actually going backwards. You know, you really can't stay still in the spiritual life because of that, because of how much I think Satan has a hold in society, how much he is influencing it. So, I mean, if you're not, if you're not actively pursuing um, or growing in your, in your faith life, that, I mean, inevitably you're going to be, you're going to be slipping backwards. So I don't know, that just really stuck out to me where, I mean, you, you can't remain neutral. No, you really can't. And I, and I think that's, I mean, we, we see it even in just, I mean, in any sort of growth. Mm. I mean, it's just the dynamic of growth, even apart from spirituality, right? Like if you quit growing, you start dying, mm -hmm. yeah. right? You know, it's just, uh, yeah. No, I, th I think it's a, it's a great point because I, I just love what you say about sacrifice because it feels like a sacrifice mm -hmm. at first, you know? And I know this is kind of taboo, so I, I hope like our, our viewership doesn't fall off the cliff as I say this. But I do, I, I do think of like, you know, one of the bigger threats in our community that, you know, and, and again, I don't want to, you know, kids have got to make their own choices and it doesn't have to be dramatic. But I just, I, you know, I look at our young people and I just see all that desire to follow the Lord, all that goodwill to serve the Lord, you know. And that space has to be created, that prayer time. Mm -hmm. But like the schedule is so full mm -hmm. and I just think, you know, like sometimes with sports decisions have got to be made, you know, of like, golly, do I need that third sport? Do I need that summer league? Do I need, you know, some, sometimes those choices can be direct, you know, they don't always have to be. But I think, you know, I just look at, look at our poor young people and just how yeah. full their schedule mm -hmm. is, you know, and, uh, yeah, I just think that sometimes, uh, um, you know, that, that can be one of those instances of sacrifice, right, you know, right. of just like, okay, you know, are there ways where I can carve out time for what is most important? I think for me in my life too, it, the, the conviction came to pray, right? Um, and, and I was one of those guilty of just saying yes to everything. I ask Ask my wife; she'd she'd be happy to tell you. Yeah, I, I remember that that time was mm -hmm. that time was hard. Except her. Yeah, she's always done everything perfect. Yeah, but, no, no, I mean uh, oh, except so things you she. Would say yes oh, yeah, except the to do list. Yes, yeah, she exactly. you know, was, yeah, uh, I would make sure to say yes to my things. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, you can ask her too. Um, but um, one of the things that you know, prayer really is the it's the first kind of bludgeoning force against this this culture that's built up around us is that like, you know, it's the same reason you come, it, it, you wake up in, in that those, the devil's trying to throw at you desolation. He's trying to throw those darts at you, you know? And, um, and when you come to prayer, you realize who you are. You just, you just sat with the creator of the universe, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and you felt his love for you. Mm -hmm. And naturally that just changes everything. And for me, it wasn't until prayer started, it, it might seem kind of in the reverse, but it wasn't until prayer started that I actually was able to get a proper perspective on what was just busyness mm -hmm. and what was necessary, what God actually wanted me. Because, I mean, 
we are physical beings in this world. We have a body. These bodies are meant to do things in the world. But what's the proper order of things, right? And and I I, I feel like it's kind of like an analogy of a of a house. Maybe when you when you move into a house, you know you're you're deciding where to put all the furniture you have, and and everything kind of gets messed messfully set up maybe you know or there's just that room that oh, you shouldn't go in there because there's tons of things in there well that's our lives before prayer before god really starts coming in before we start seeking as well and i think what prayer kind of does is it, it takes that house and it empties it out it's like you know no the couch would be better here uh -huh. this is going to make it all in such better uh -huh. order and and realize that it all takes time you're, you're building up an entire a model this house has got to be put together from the littlest details mm -hmm. and every placement matters and 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 that is truly building out God's will in our life is it, it's the placement of things you didn't think would have mattered before mm -hmm. but they do they matter immensely to God and they might matter for one of your kids mm -hmm. finding their own prayer life mm -hmm. you know getting our mm -hmm. own selves in order that might help your kids down the line mm -hmm. so now, to me, it's it really it comes back to that first point. It's like it, if if you're going to take away nothing else from these things, it ought to be that prayer should just never stop uh -huh. because God will work through that, and things that weren't convictions before will become convictions, and you'll have the strength to give that no that was harder or that yes that you've been called to. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, just to build off of that imagery of, of rearranging the furniture in the house. Because it does. I mean, when we pray, God places certain desires in our heart, certain insights in our mind that are going to make all the difference. And it may not seem clear to us how moving the couch here spiritually is going to make all that big a difference, but He's got the big picture. I think of, you know, when, when we work as a, a parish staff, you know, we try to come up with initiatives and such for the parish. And that can be an area where we're just being busy to be busy. Mm -hmm. Like we're doing it without God, you know, and then we're just running around like, like chickens with our heads cut off, right? right? And one of the things that's really helped us as a staff is we went to a, a conference one time and, and Father Ricardo spoke, and I know a lot of our, our folks are, are very familiar with, with Father John's work. Um, but he talked about how he was at a school, or he was at a parish with a school, and they were doing a, a renovation on the school or an addition, and so they would have to talk to the construction folks a lot throughout the day, you know. And uh, um, he said, you know, now and again when they were talking with them, the workers would would kind of excuse themselves and say, "Oh, we got to go to the trailer." They, they would speak of that often, you know. And finally, you know, Father John and his team are wondering, okay, what's, what's this trailer that they've yeah. got to keep going back to, you know? And, uh, you know, the trailer was, was the place where they had the blueprints, where they had the blueprints for the plan, mm -hmm. or for the, the project. And it's just a reminder to us that, you know, as a staff, when we've got to make decisions, you know, sometimes we'll get, we'll get so caught up in the discussion, one person throwing out one view, another person throwing out another view, that we just have to say, okay, you know what? Let's go to the trailer. Yeah. In other words, let's, let's just as a staff go and silently pray before God because He's the one that's got the blueprint. So I, I just think what you're saying is terrific. You know, we do get to be people who are just running around, just exhausted just chasing one thing after another, saying yes to everything. And it's just not bearing fruit because we're not following the blueprint. Right. We're not asking the, the master architect, you know, what's your plan for me today? You know, what do you want me to clear out time for? What project do you want me to engage in today? And what do you want me to say no to today? And if we could do that, we could just expend far less energy and our efforts would just bear a lot more fruit. Mm -hmm. And I think to speak to that, you know, we have a, and a lot of us struggle with this, is we have an epidemic of, of anxiety and depression. And I think these are natural things that follow 
when we are running around like chickens with our heads cut off. I, I know it, when I was when I was especially doing that, not caring what God wanted in my life. And I, I don't claim I've arrived by any sense again. Ask my wife, you know. In, in, in a lot of these things, probably in and of themselves, were things that were good. Mm. Yep. Yes. That, that God would approve of. It's just they weren't right for Taylor at time X, right, yes. which you're, is what makes this discernment so important. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. You're not discerning necessarily like, oh, should I do evil today or should I do good? You know, I think a lot of us know, at least because just because of the nature of the place we grew up in, that like, well, you shouldn't really do, <laughs> let's put evil out of the picture, right? You're normally discerning between two goods. Well, there is actually a great and the good. You know, to, to make that distinguishing point that, well, God has a plan. Just ask him, you know. And, yeah. and um, yeah, I think that that's just, but naturally, when we pursue what we want to our end, there is that, there are those tendencies where, um, that come up to us, in us, toward anxiety or depression or anything like that. And, and that's a natural consequence of, it, it could be of many things, right? I, I, don't, I don't want to paint too broad of a picture there. I know there's a lot of reasons people struggle with that that aren't this. But I think it is a built-in thing in us where, I mean, it's really the absence of peace. And, and maybe if, if you're struggling with that, m that might be a thing to consider. It's like, well, am I praying? Am I, am I, am I asking God what he wants? Because if I'm not, then I'm, I'm always going to struggle to find peace in life. Because you're ultimately not going down the path God created you for. I think a lot of it, too, just starts with that. You know, I know we try to impress upon folks being vulnerable and being real in prayer. So I'm discouraged, I'm depressed, I'm overwhelmed. Well, then just be open with the Lord about it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I feel like I've got too much on my plate today. Well, let the Lord into that. And then naturally he's going to start showing you maybe things you could drop off or give less mental energy or worry to or things you could do instead. Right. And, uh, but it's, it's just that being very vulnerable, being very real with those areas of hurt, with those areas of, you know, where I need to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Well, and I know even, you know, we, our group just met this past Monday and that was kind of something I shared and uh, Taylor kind of, you know, Reminded me of this is okay. Take the take it to prayer. You know, if you have a lot on your plate, like ask God to multiply those efforts. Like, you know, because so many times I know it's it, it constantly that kind of ongoing struggle of like I need to do these things. I need to do this. I need to do this. It's like, well, obviously I might physically I need to do it, but am I surrendering that over? You know, to Him. You know, giving that to Him and trusting in Him that okay, He will He will make these things work. He will. Um, I guess guide those efforts, or am I putting him aside? Say, God, I'm you know I'm too busy for you. I have all these other things I need to do. It's like, well, maybe you should invite him into that moment to help guide. You know, that's a him. that's a great way of getting giving him permission mm -hmm. to kind of reorder our priorities right. and our schedule too, right? Because if we say, okay, Lord, I've got to do task X today, and I just you know I want to do it in a way that glorifies you. I want I want to. Just feel your presence with me in the midst of it. Well, if the Lord doesn't want us doing task X, like if he'd rather have us do something else, or just take, you know, just silent time with him, that really allows him to tell, tell us that too. Mm -hmm. You know, which I, I just think is a, a beautiful way of, yeah, because so often we just, we don't ask God, we don't give him, we don't make him Lord of our schedule, mm -hmm. you know, and that's a great way of doing it by just inviting him into the tasks that are in front of yeah. us. Then it, it just allows him to maybe reorder that schedule if it needs to be reordered, you know, right. or if it just needs to be tweaked. Right. Or, I mean, for me, a lot of times it's, it's kind of that frequent prayer of, you know, you know, what's in front of me today and whatever, whatever gets completed. Great. You know, I ask you to be present throughout and whatever doesn't, then give me that peace just to, put it aside and especially you know and in, in the married vocation you know once you put work aside you don't want it consuming you then during that family time you know having that separation just having that you know having that peace I think what's interesting about all this is as you said that it just came up in my mind that you know <clears throat> we're not moving toward complexity in the spiritual life we're moving toward 
simplicity mm. Mm. in the sense that like uh-huh. all these things exist consolation mm-hmm. desolation all these movements all the things we've talked about they exist because we don't love god as we should we forget to love ourselves as we should uh-huh. therefore we don't love everyone around us as we should yeah. and the answer to all of it is always coming back to him uh-huh. Always just going, Lord, you you are who you say you are, mm-hmm. and I am who you say I am. Mm-hmm. Help me to believe that today and to move into that simplicity. Mm-hmm. In my life, it's always the temptation away from that simplicity mm-hmm. that complicates things. Mm-hmm. It's like, right. no, That's just believe point. that general basic truth. You are a child of God. You were created to do His will. Mm-hmm. And he's going to give you the power to do it in your life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is Amen. beautiful. That, that is beautiful. <laughs> Golly. Yeah, the, the, what arises in my heart when you say that is just, uh, it is almost that movement, right, of like, okay, like when I forget about God, life gets really complex. I'm chasing a lot of things. And uh, just that humble acknowledgement of, okay, like this isn't working really well. Mm-hmm. Like, God, what do you want? That's just a dramatic move towards simplicity, towards basic, you know? And then whenever we, whenever we do that, whenever, like, God, like, what do you want? Like, it gets better, yeah. and it certainly gets simpler. But then, of course, you know, we do that for a while, and then we lapse back towards the complexity of just letting life dictate stuff instead of letting God dictate. Mm-hmm. And then we just have to have that humility to go back again and say, God, this isn't working again. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. And repeat, repeat <laughs> oh, yeah. that cycle time well, and I mean, time again. <laughs> and I think that's the important thing with, you know, understanding some of this, going through these rules, is understanding that cycle, understanding how those those natural fluctuations occur. And I think that recogni- recognition almost puts, I'll say, barriers on it, or kind of like, you know, I think, has, um, almost like guardrails on our, on our road to growth in the spiritual life, where, you know, it keeps us from going off the road and crashing. You know, we were, we're still going to continuously bounce back and forth, but having that understanding and that and knowing those cycles are going to allow us to keep moving, um, you know, towards Him. Continue that projection, at least. I, I think that's the great blessing of these these Ignatian rules is that we do. I mean, I, I know spiritually, I feel like a, a leaf in the wind a lot, mm-hmm. where one day it's going great, the next day I'm falling apart, and so. I just think Ignatius does give us, as you say, those, those guardrails to say, okay, when I'm having those bad days, you know, how do I keep perspective? Mm-hmm. How do I connect with God in the midst of that? How do I not, how do I not, as you say, like go through the, you know, drive off the cliff, yeah. you know, and it just, it really does bring a balance. Uh, yeah, just a, a kind of greater equanimity to our life, which I, I, I do think that's the great blessing. Because I, I know for me, I'm, I'm so prone to be just guided by my emotions. Mm-hmm. You know, well, I think to, that's what society almost teaches you to do. You know, if you feel like this, you know, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. Just, you know, yeah, very much like you said with the, the leaf in the wind, just, you know, how much we cater to our emotions, how much we cater to our feelings, which, I mean, obviously they're real. I mean, we're, we're you know, we're human. We have these, but we don't need to be consumed by them. Like, that doesn't need to dictate and direct our every action of our life. Um, and spiritually it's so deadly because it's like if I feel close to God then I'm close to God and if I feel apart from God I'm mm-hmm. apart from God you know and it's just oh it just sets us up for so many so many lies that the devil can set us up for you know where you know I'm probably not that different spiritually from where I was yesterday right <laughs> you know right. but because the feeling is so different right, right you know I just feel like there's this this huge spiritual crisis in my life and uh yeah, just trying to navigate that to be able to say, okay, that's not true. Mm-hmm. That's not true, you know. I think this is a good place to to kind of bring it to a close too, and and just to to realize in all this, I think the big point we can take away is that you're called to be a child of God. The main way you're going to do that is learning about who Jesus is, learning about what He came to tell us, learning that through the truth of the church participating in the sacraments and ultimately that lively relationship with him is going to bring us into the just the the full grace that the sacraments and everything were intended to give us and and we will have 
the road will be a, a bit bumpy from time to time, but to realize there's great help in what the church brings us and, and to realize that we can do this. And as a community and as, as people that want to do it together, we will have even more help in getting there. And, and that's actually going to bring us to uh, the next episode. And in that one, we're going to be talking about fortifying this, uh, all that we've learned about our relationship with God. If, you, if you're feeling a particular movement in your heart, or, or maybe you've been doing this for a while where you've been praying, you've been, been engaging that relationship, what we're going to be talking about in the next episode is, is to bring fortification to that, to, to realize that you have a community of people around you that probably feel the same way as you are. Um, I know in my life, that is, is absolutely essential to continue on this path, to have people around you that can remind you of who you are, right? Because in those times of desolation, it's not always too apparent. Mm. So that's what we're going to get into in the next episode is fortification. How do you do that? How can we practically do that in St. Mary's Parish? And we're excited to see you there. And Father, would you end us uh, with a blessing as well? For sure. Lord God, we praise and thank you for your presence with us. Whether we're in spiritual consolation, whether we're in spiritual desolation, whether we're anywhere in between, that you walk with us. We thank you for being our rock, for being what grounds us in the midst of all the ups and downs of life. We ask that you be with us in a particular way this upcoming week, that we may know your presence, experience it in new ways. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. See you next week.